Comic fam on the phone with David Avalone, the writer of Elvira, and there is an Indiegogo that is ending this week that I'm so excited to share with the comic fam. David, what is it like to be the person responsible for writing down the historical record of one of the most important figures in horror and you use the word figures advisedly uh yes uh she's uh she is a legend and there is definitely a responsibility i feel but honestly since the beginning she has been so supportive of my work and complimentary about my work we did some interviews the other day and it was kind of mind-blowing to hear elvira who i've known as a character in tv shows and movies since i was probably 16 years old say over and over how much she loves me and loves my work and all that is quite a thing to, to wrap your head around but yeah i'm actually very happy to be the caretaker of her legacy aside from everything else she does i imagine the pressure being at least at the beginning because you've been doing it for a minute now being quite extreme i mean you mentioned in your thank you page in this very comic that she is your muse cassandra peterson that is and you know how does that pressure get managed especially when you are also trying to serve the comic readers you know providing them something fun something yes sexy but classy at the same time yeah well classy and also i mean mostly funny i've read back over some of the Elvira comics over the years, and I've seen some unsuccessful pitches that were thrown her way. And usually the thing that people forget is they lean into the horror and they lean away from the comedy. And that's sort of exactly wrong. The horror is more incidental. The comedy is foundational. It's a comedy character. She's funny. And uh, when we started working on it and I was floundering is the wrong word, but I was sitting around going, what am I going to do? Artist Dave Acosta, who was the artist on the first 12 issues of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, sent me pages and covers from 1950s like Jerry Lewis comics and Bob Hope comics and Abbott and Costello comics and stuff like that. And he said, I think this is what we're doing. This isn't Tales from the Crypt. It's Mad Magazine doing a horror issue. And yeah, so as soon as I let go of trying to scare people, it's I'm making them laugh at least every two panels. There's a very famous expression, you know, dying is easy, comedy is hard. It's a very different pressure uh, than telling an adventure story. How much of the creative process is uh, back and forth with uh, Cassandra? I submit generally a pitch or a premise. If it's for a whole series, maybe a couple of sentences, an issue saying, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Cassandra gives me a thumbs up, thumbs down, speaking for Elvira, as she often does. Then I go to script. The scripts go to Cassandra and she uh, makes notes if she has any. Sometimes she doesn't. I would say the maximum number of notes I've ever gotten, three joke suggestions, which is light. (laughs) You know, that's not a lot of notes at all. A little flavor. And they're her. So they're always gold. And she's always very kind and says, you don't have to use these. These are just suggestions. And I'm like, I'm not going to use Elvira jokes that Elvira wrote in my Elvira comic. That seems counterproductive. So, uh, so yeah, she's, she is the muse in that, in the sense that, My entire job, and I think the comics do well because, fingers crossed, I've been able to do this successfully, the entire job is someone reading the comic has to hear her voice. You accomplished that perfectly well. Thank you. It's the artist's job, and in the case of the Indiegogo, it's Sylvia Califano, who's amazing. It's their job to make them feel like they're looking at Elvira. It's my job to make it feel like they're listening to Elvira. I don't know what I should say about the fact that I easily slip into vulgar showgirl next door. But we talk, we've talked about that a lot. And the Elvira voice, what makes what she created and what makes it so unique and why there's only one and no imitator has ever gained even remotely any kind of purchase on her. It's a beautiful woman in a sexy dress who talks like a 70 year old stand up comic in the Catskills working a little blue after midnight. And that's uh, that's the vibe. And apparently I can do aging Jewish stand-up comic really well. (laughs) And it's, you know, I've had variations of that job before. I did a Twilight Zone book for for Dynamite. And really, there's nothing to that franchise that you can do to make the audience feel like, oh, there's a Twilight Zone story. I mean, plenty of stories have twists at the end. All I could do was a really good impression of Rod Serling in the narration. So the people reading it would go, I know what this is. I like this. 
And you mentioned uh, Sylvia Califano, who absolutely brings the talent on this issue. Um, and I wanted to bring that around because this is not only the 40th anniversary of Elvira, uh, making this uh, incredible opportunity to chat with you. And I appreciate you taking the time today to chat. Oh, my pleasure. But this is also a key moment for the character, doing something that many would think is unspeakable, killing Elvira in her own comic. Now, I have to first know whose idea was that? That was my idea. Was that your idea? Did you get any pushback? No, I think... I, you know, I think when I, when I sent them the pitch for this, they asked me to come up with a special 32 page special for Elvira's 40th anniversary. I've done big things with Elvira. She's gone to hell. She's, you know, met Satan face to face. What do you do that's big enough for that? And I thought it would be really nice to do a comic that recapitulated her entire life. And particularly that Cassandra hadn't finished writing her memoir yet. So we actually went out for drinks and dinner and I said, tell me all of the funniest, best anecdotes that are going to go in your memoir so I can kind of get them into this. But the idea was, I was thinking about how great would it be to have all of the people from her life and career sitting around talking about her. I think I might have even thought of Broadway Danny Rose as an inspiration for that because that's a great framing device. But then I went, but why are they doing that? Why are they sitting around? And I was like, well, well she, what if she's dead? Then, of course, how did she die? Originally, it was going to be a, an accident, and I was going to figure out a way to undo it in the last page. But it's a comic book. And I think one of the ways I, I prevented there from being pushback is I immediately referenced the death of Superman. I was like, look, we have the death of blank over and over again in the history of comic books, and we undo it by... Sometimes, you know, DC took a year to bring original recipe Superman back. We're not going to, we're going to have it. We're going to work that out by the end of the issue. So I don't think that's a big surprise uh, since we're doing more Elvira projects ongoing that it's a comic book death and it's excuse for a bunch of people to stand around talking about her. And it adds by making it not an accident, it needed a story, an overarching story that connects all of the, and the story is that the wake is where we're going to find out who murdered her. Did the killer show up to gloat over her dead body? The classic who done it. Exactly. Exactly. So it's a little little tiny bit of Agatha Christie in there because uh, it's just it's such a classic trope. I found it a really special thing to enter into this comic of, all right, yeah, we're getting that classic death story, you know, Superman, as you mentioned, but it matters so much more than that because you're actually telling uh, stories about her life throughout this 40 years and recording this history in a comic book in a fun way, in an entertaining way, but something that is incredibly important for her legacy. I really wanted to to honor her and honor that 40th anniversary and also show in a comedy sense, all of the steps that go from the little girl in Manhattan, Kansas, the city that always sleeps to this internationally recognizable, beloved icon Uh, With a gigantic global fan base, all ages, you know, across the board. And yeah, so so it's a it's a thing to, to carry that around and go. This has to be good for her. This has to be good for them. But again, I've 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 received so much positive reinforcement for what we're doing in these comics that I it frees me up to to take it into unusual and challenging places sometimes. Well, congratulations to uh, you, David, and uh, Sylvia, because you're now part of that legacy, too. Let's chat about the Indiegogo. You have until the end of the week, Comic Fam. Clear past the funding status. I mean, we're above 55K at this point at the time of this filming. But you know we got to get it to 66,666. It's a very entertaining comic. Uh, Sylvia's art is amazing. Came across her work on Star Trek uh, Year 5 at IDW. And when uh, when it turned out that Dave Acosta was going to be too busy to do this comic, Juan Samu, who did Elvira meets Vincent Price, was drawing Elvira meets Vincent Price at the time that we did this comic. Um, I suggested Sylvia and she, you know, every artist has to pass muster with Cassandra. She looks at the art and says thumbs up, thumbs down. And uh, her work is just amazing. She really captures Cassandra's sassiness and personality beautifully forget the writing for a minute the art alone is worth reading the book and there's also because of the nature of the her of of cassandra's life and elvira's life 
there's a ton of celebrity cameos in it. And I don't name any names. It's all Sylvia. You recognize them or you don't. You did the Elvis story. Comic fam, you got to read this just for the Elvis story because it's true. Of all of the things in the comic, the one that's the longest and sort of stays closest to the reality is the meeting Elvis scene and the the things that he told, like she told me verbatim, you know, what they talked about. And I put it in the comic because I think it's a funny thing to be someone whose career on a career path and you meet Elvis and Elvis goes, leave Vegas, baby. You know, like that's a Vegas, not for you, baby. Go somewhere else. World's full of showgirls. <laughs> so fantastic to me that she had that experience. And also I'm a huge since childhood, James Bond and Fellini fan. And the fact that she may be the only person on earth who's been in a James Bond movie and in a Fellini movie. I think there's one or two Italian actresses who may have shown up in early Bond movies, but uh, she's in Diamonds Are Forever as a showgirl in Vegas, because that's where she was. And she's in Roma in about 20 different parts scattered all over the movie. And she is not hard to see because there are not a lot of redheads in that movie. You can you can see her crowd of hippies and like, oh, there's a beautiful redheaded girl in the foreground. You also mentioned Dave Acosta, who actually does one of the three different covers being solicited for this run. There's also a John Royal cover, which is gorgeous. And then, of course, the classic photo cover. I also noticed that there is like a collection of comics that Dynamite's releasing along with this. Mm -hmm. Elvira's been in comics for quite a long time, but a lot of these were very unlikely to be reprinted. And I'm seeing a 26.666 issue issues being reprinted for this Indiegogo celebrating the 40th anniversary. Yeah, it's wild. I I actually chose not to look at the Claypool Claypool comics before I started working. Probably smart. I didn't want to I didn't want to repeat anything that had already been done. I didn't want to have it in my head. Now that I've written somewhere near 30 32 Elvira comics, I I got the collection so that I could look at it and see what had gone before. But I one thing about Dave, Dave Acosta's cover I probably would have remembered this by the time we got to finishing the project, but Dave did the cover while I was still writing. And he, I can't remember whose idea it was. It was probably his idea to have Elvira standing in front of her own gravestone. It's like digging her own grave is what it looks like. I had forgotten that there's a line in the first Elvira movie where she's facing death and she says, I hope, you know, it's like, what do you want your epitaph to be? And she says, I hope people remember that I was always also a great pair of legs. <laughs> and Dave is. drew that on her tombstone. And I went, right. I remember that line. But Dave got there first. I had not remembered it when I proposed this comic that she did actually famously have an epitaph which is I was also a great set of legs. It's such an important IP and it's it's great to hear that the creators are all taking this seriously all the oh, way to yeah. the cover artists to you David. It's why I've been such a big fan of Dynamite for so long. Um so many uh intellectual properties that have such a strong fan base that's all being served appropriately often. You know, Dynamite is certainly not the richest company in the business. And the good news about that is we all do this because we love these characters and we love working with them. Matt Wagner did not do his death of Margot Lane at Dynamite for the money. (laughs) He did it because he loves the shadow. It makes it an ideal circumstance. And Dynamite's leadership from, you know, Joe Ryband, the senior editor, to Nikki, the, the, the CEO, are so supportive and so great with us that it makes it very easy to work there. Death of Elvira, doing the unthinkable. David Avaloni, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It was great talking to you. And as always, geek responsibly. Book has hit 20 bucks. Let off the gas. Colin Fennelis, you're really gunning for some Jack for the goodness. $75 cover price on this. Don't overbid. But if somebody wants it, we got it. 